to order the Gateway School Board of Directors regular board meeting for Tuesday, September 15th, 2020. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Bonnie, can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Mrs. Cerucci? Here. Mrs. Delaney? Here. Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Gottman? Here. Mr. McIntyre? Here. Mr. Ritter? Here. Mrs. Warning? Here. Mr. Williams? Here. And Mr. Clary is absent, correct? Correct, due to a death in the family. Our sympathies to the Clary family. Okay, I'm gonna skip comments from residents on agenda items and come back to that um, after item four, which is discussion on MS4 tax and property tax exemption. This evening, I've invited two of our solicitors to speak at tonight's board meeting, Weiss Burkhardt and Kramer. Uh, Attorney Deanna Burkhardt is here to represent their firm. Uh, typically, real estate and litigation are issues discussed in executive session, but since the Monroeville Council chose to make false and unprofessional allegations against the Gateway School District publicly at last Tuesday night's council meeting, we felt obligated to respond. After watching the council meeting, it is clear that there is a, a misunderstanding regarding the delinquent taxes owed on the Club for Life, otherwise known as the Racket Club property. It is also clear that council has little to no understanding of the MS4 lawsuit we have filed against them regarding the stormwater management fee and how the church issue became relevant. Yes, council, we do understand the difference between a tax and a fee. So we will also have attorney Dice, uh, this is Chelsea <coughs> Bruce Dice here to address that issue. Um, so attorney Janet Burkhart is here via Zoom. We are gonna begin uh, with her. And I would just like to know if you could first just provide everybody with a background of your firm. You might have to unmute yourself too, Janet. Am I unmuted? Okay. So our firm collects delinquent tax for Gateway and School District. We've been doing that for a lot of years. And we do that at absolutely no cost to the district. I don't know what questions you wanna ask me. I have the supervisor of our department also online, Ann Wargo. She actually is the paralegal assigned to Gateway. And so every question, every resident who calls our office regarding Gateway delinquent tax will speak only to Ann which is a feature that most delinquent tax collection firms can't offer you. Um, if you have questions about how your delinquent tax program works, I'm happy to answer those questions. Well, I think, uh, Attorney Burkhardt, that the public doesn't really understand, you know, how all these things work. So I just thought a background. Okay, okay let, me, understand. Let, me start, let me start with Act 20 of 2006 which was an effort by the legislature to ensure that school districts do not have to use current tax dollars to pay for the collection of delinquent taxes. And that act shifted the burden for the costs of collection to the delinquent taxpayer. So in essence, school districts don't pay for the cost of collection delinquent taxpayers pay their own costs of collection. And that's very important because delinquent taxpayers starting in 2006, when everybody adopted their resolution, saw all the fees, commissions, late fees, everything added to their own account. And they pay them and those all go back with the exception of the commission to the school district to ensure that the school district is not using current tax funds to pay to collect delinquent taxes. And that was a turning point for, for school districts and a very brave act by the legislature to change the structure of how 
delinquent taxes are handled. That's what our office does. And um, all the delinquent costs and fees are paid by the delinquent property owner. Well, then can you speak to the issue of what happens when a delinquent property owner requests relief from delinquent taxes and or interest and penalty fees? How does that handle? Okay, we always recommend that the school district not waive fees because once you start waiving fees, you become a board that's in the business of judging whose story is sadder. So the statute says these are the fees. There's a 10% um, penalty, there's a 10% commission, if there's interest, there's interest. If there's lien fees, there's lien fees. And those are statutory. So we tell boards, and we've told you, you don't waive those fees. But what you can do, is if somebody's in trouble, and we find this a lot, we put them on a payment plan. It's generally a one-year payment plan because we don't want these to get real old. But if they can't do a one year payment plan, we give them an application for a hardship. If they qualify for a hardship, we'll do a two year payment plan. But we try to keep those as short as possible. And that's in the district's best interest. Okay. And then from, from your records, has anyone representing the buyer for the Racket Club Lane property contacted your office for a payment plan and or reduction in interest or fees? No, that's the funny thing. No one ever did contact us. Had they contacted us, we offer a one-year payment plan. That would have been an automatic situation. We'd, we received no phone calls. Ira Weiss received no phone calls. And Wargo received no phone calls. I received no phone calls. No one contacted us about a problem with this property. But had they contacted us, we would have said, of course, we will give you a one-year payment option. They didn't contact us. Instead, they paid in full. I'm sorry, did you say they paid in full? Yes, they did. So it's the taxes on this property are no longer delinquent and everything Correct. is paid in full up to date. Correct. OK. Um, do you desire to get abandoned properties back on the tax rolls? Excuse me? Is it a desire or a goal of your firm for us to get properties back on the tax rolls if they're delinquent? Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything is focused towards getting properties back to being productive on the tax rolls. And we assist homeowners and we assist taxpayers in vacant property and elderly folks if they have problems. We do everything we can to help them get back on the tax rolls. And I would say to you and to the board, this may be the first time you've ever had a complaint about our services, and yet it was a complaint that was unfounded because we had never been contacted. Yeah, and for the record, Attorney Burkhardt, I think the complaint was against the school district, not you, but we're thankful for you to take the time to be here uh, just to answer our questions and to make the situation a little more clear to our council members and our taxpayers who are watching. So I, I do wanna thank you on behalf of my colleagues for taking the time to join us this evening. Uh, we don't wanna keep you too long, but I would like to just open it up to other board members if anyone else has any questions for Attorney Burkhart. Is there any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Seeing okay. none. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. You're very welcome. Um, in relation to that question, uh, I want to also, for the record, ask Mr. Schott, did anybody from representing the, the property from the Racket Club Lane contact you about tax relief? No, no one from the property contact myself or anyone in my office. Okay. And, uh, Mr. Dice or Ms. Dice, did anyone contact your law firm on behalf of this property? 
No, we didn't, we didn't receive any calls concerning this property, but in fact, I ended up calling the attorney for Club for Life, um, I believe uh, on Monday to confirm whether what transpired. And it's my understanding that the information solicitor um, concerning whether or not Gateway would provide a payment plan or not. And I explained that it's our standard that we always provide at least a one year. He never contacted us. He admitted he never contacted us. He said in the future he should. And it was at his error. So that's all I have. Okay, thank you for that. Well, it's not all you have because we're gonna move on to our <laughs> yeah. next topic of discussion, which is the MS4 lawsuit. So, um, Ms. Dice, can you give just a background for the viewers watching on what exactly this MS4 lawsuit is about and how it came about? Sure. So um, MS4 fees are fees that are generated as a result of what's called an NPDES permit. That permit is issued to a municipality um, to collect and manage stormwater. Um, Monroeville developed an ordinance and adopt, enacted it on October 9th, 2018. And in part of that ordinance, it was called the Pollution Control and Flood Reduction Fee Ordinance. And what it did was it was enacted to collect um, fees to defray the cost to operate, maintain, repair, replace, or improve the stormwater system in Monroeville. And because it was adopted in October of 2018, the effective date became January 1st of 19. And if you are a property owner within the municipality, um, depending on the amount of impervious surface, surface, so surface that has some type of pavement or some construction on it, they were, they devised a calculation for a fee for each property owner to pay to the municipality to um, address, upgrade, well, upgrade and improve the stormwater sewer system. And in fact, I'm going to read a provision in the ordinance that says that the imposition of rental rates and charges at section three of the ordinance states, it's for the use of benefit by in the services rendered by Monroeville storm sewer system, including operation, maintenance, repair, replacement, and improvement of said system, and all other expenses, rental rates, and charges are hereby imposed upon each and every property that is connected with and uses in a service by or is benefited by the Monroeville storm sewer system, either directly or indirectly, on the owners of such properties. Such rental rates and charges are imposed January of each year, which means that you have a fee every year. All residents here who own property also had to pay these fees and you probably paid them um, since 2019. Gateway in 2019 had 11 properties. I believe the properties have not changed to, to the They'll have 11 properties but the fee amounts to for gateway is ninety thousand two hundred twenty eight dollars and sixty cents so when the fee this ordinance came down we looked at it along with um actually other school districts because they were also interested in this litigation and looking at the school code um we it's our legal opinion that the school would be exempt from these fees because section 776 of the school code says that we are exempt from every kind of state, county, city, borough, or other tax, as well as from all costs or expenses for paving, curbing, sidewalks, sewers, or other municipal improvements. So it was our legal opinion that the district would be exempt from these taxes. When I learned from Paul Schott that these fees were paid, <clears throat> we proceeded to appeal the process. 
and under the ordinance um, it requires you to appeal to the municipal manager first so first we um, got our notices i believe it was in december of 2018 gateway paid their fees january of 2019 property we get the denial back from the municipal manager on march 13th at which time i contact the municipal solicitor and we have a discussion because in court if you want to appeal a decision from a manager um, in this arena you would normally file what's called a statutory appeal it's administrative appeal and you go down one route in the court system after speaking with a municipal solicitor, we both agreed because we're challenging the validity of the ordinance and not challenging how you calculate the fee. We don't dispute how they calculate it, but we're challenging the validity of does it apply to us? We agreed to waive all time refrains in having to file that statutory appeal. It's a waste of time, money, and energy for all parties. So on april 2nd we filed what's called a declaratory judgment action a declaratory judgment is a, a case it's a complaint that you file in the court of common pleas it is essentially asking the court to declare whatever the contractual or in this instance the ordinance is applicable or not applicable to the school district and so once the court makes a determination it becomes binding even if the ordinance is still written the way it is if the court would come down and say it's not we're exempt then we're exempt regardless of whether or not the ordinance is written improperly as a result of um gateway filing i um there were other school districts that also filed a similar action um, because there are more than one school district actually in the jurisdictional limits of Monroeville, Forbes Road, as well as the AIU Sunrise School. And so both of those entities are affected by the exact same ordinance um, with respect to this litigation. On April 25th of 2019, another school district also asked to be a part of this. It was Cornell School District. Um, and the courts eventually on August 14th, 2019, granted that um, that Cornell School District would be part of this litigation. The same thing happened with West Allegheny School District, although we just got the order August 10th that they are part of this litigation. Um, procedurally, the next step was on December 31st, 2019, Monroeville answered, finally answered our complaint we were going back and forth with how are we doing this i you know this the, all the solicitors were trying to figure out what's the best way to move this case forward so can i interrupt sure it sounds like you were working with the municipality about this you oh, were attempting absolutely. to settle this you were attempting to work not settle but you were attempting to work out the details and you were in communication with them throughout this process yes and okay. and the solicitor in Monroeville and I have worked very well on this and very accommodating, both, I, I think, on both ends and with all the parties because now we have um, two, well, we have five school districts technically, and then we have five, three um, municipal entities. One is a, a water authority, so I don't want, it's not a municipality. Um, so as we, we filed our, or they filed their answer. And so anytime you file a complaint in the courts, they have, the other side has an obligation to answer those allegations. And then part of that pleading that they do is they file what's called new matter. New matter is their defenses. And Monroeville filed their defenses. And I just want to, uh, outline in their defenses in the new matter they pled that the ms4 fees and that's what these stormwater management fees are was fair and reasonable and then they also pled that the ms4 fee is required to be assessed imposed leaned and collected on a uniform basis based upon the area of impervious surface on each parcel i then replied 
to the defenses, the new mountain. And that's what I did on January, I believe, 23rd. And after looking at the ordinance and seeing what they did, I determined that their ordinance allowed for a 25% reduction for religious organizations that are exempt pursuant to 501c3 if they have, and they have two requirements. And one of the requirements says, if the property is used only for the conduct of religious services, and, and then it says, or, so you don't need religious services. It just says, or religious education. And then the other caveat to it is no exempt activities are conducted on the property. So, or no non-exempt activities are conducted on the property. So when Monroeville pled that they apply this uniformly, it was my re legal response, according to their ordinance, that you don't apply it uniformly. And not only do you not apply it uniformly, you don't do it with education. Because if a parochial school or a religious school is operating on a Tuesday and teaching math and science and social studies and literacy and facts class and whatever else that uh, kids are learning across the street or at Gateway, but they also get a religious class, does that school get the 25% reduction? This issue was just a collateral issue that I raised because they said it was uniform. It is, to me, legally is not uniform, and I felt it was our legal obligation to respond that way. Um, as a result of our pleading, I believe Monroeville has now amended their ordinance to um, eliminate that provision with respect to the 25% discount. And what they did was they um, adopted the ordinance so that it's effective from 2021 moving forward. And I believe that the section that they eliminated is still in play because we paid in 2019. I'm not sure if Paul can answer better if we paid in 2020 or not. But because the ordinance language was in effect at the time of 19 and 20, I believe it's still an issue for the courts. So I've not removed anything from our litigation or anything like that. I, I would recommend to keep it in there and maybe we can use it for settlement purposes in the future, but I wouldn't recommend removing it now. And that is all I have. So churches came into the discussion, basically, you're saying because you had to refute their statement that the fees were applied uniformly because clearly they weren't and you read directly from their ordinance. Correct. Okay. And then, so we were asked to remove the church from the lawsuit. You touched on that a little bit. I believe there was a request. There was a, a request for us to remove that. Yes. And what was your legal opinion on why we should or should not remove that? I would never recommend to a client to remove an issue unless there's something more on the table towards settlement. And there was nothing other than please remove this. And I understand, as, per, as a lawyer, I'm putting my lawyer hat on and representing the taxpayers and this is what we have to do. I would not recommend removing it. Now, again, it can be a for something for settlement, but I would not recommend removing it. Well, now, there's five other people involved in this lawsuit, so how does that play if we hypothetically said, okay, we'll try to remove it, what would well, be required? So I believe that the AIU and Forbes Road would still have a claim. I don't know what um, Cornell School District and West Allegheny's um, ordinances state per se. I can't recall whether they have the discount. I don't believe so, but I don't want to misspeak. So I don't know if those two would have authority, or if they have any fight in that game or in this issue. The minimum would be three districts would have to agree. Correct. Gateway, Forbes, and AIU. They would have to agree also to remove it in order for that to actually happen. Correct. 
and whose best interest would that actually be in if that were to happen? Well, I listened to the Monroeville's council meeting and as Mr. Ratcher said on the council, at the council meeting, it is in the Mon Monroeville's best interest for their lawsuit to remove it. And so, yes, I think it would be in Monroeville's best interest, not Gateway or the other plaintiffs in the suit. And who do you represent, Chelsea? <laughs> Gateway. I actually represent Forbes Road as well, and I did not recommend the Forbes to remove it. So. Okay. And, um, Oh, I know what I wanted to ask you about the reason um, for the statute in the first place. We talked about this, you and I previously about the whole taxation and you felt that that was part of the reason the statute even exists. Can you just yeah. explain that a little bit? Well, we're using the municipal or the school district gets taxpayer funds to supplement their budget. Taxpayers are paying for all of you here, including myself. And um, now to implement a fee against the district to do this work, you're, it, it's like a double taxation in my mind. I'm not gonna say that that's exactly what's happening, but now you're asking the taxpayer to pay their property tax to the school district. And now school district take those property tax dollars and put it back to the municipality. And now school, you have to come up with this extra $90,000 over here to fill your budget or because you no longer had that money. You no longer have it in your budget. And I don't believe the legislature created the statute to, um, you know, to, to create a double taxation. They're going to try to eliminate that. Let's use the money as most efficiently and effectively as we can. I just thought that was interesting insight and I thought it was it was worthy to bring up because the homeowners paying the fee and they're asking the school district to pay the fee, but we get the fee from the homeowners who are paying who the fee. Who are already paying the fee. Okay. And they're paying their school tax. And they're paying their school tax. Right. Like triple so, taxation in a way. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I don't like to open up the floor to any other board members who have questions for Chelsea or Bruce. Chelsea. Um, the council's reason to send you to amend the ordinance. Does that have any effect on our losses moving forward? Well, the collateral issue goes away from 21, 2021 forward, moving forward. But for 2019 and 2020, I believe it's still an issue out there. Um, I think ultimately we just, I think the school code, the main issue though, is the one to focus on. This, this is, I, I think we have a great case and I think ultimately we will win. And then if the municipality wants to implement a discount thereafter, they can do that. That's a way around. So is it your opinion that it's our fault that the churches in the community are being, um, what's the word, they're being charged now with discount that was initially given to them for the first two years? It, it is not Gateway School District implementing the MS4 fees. So we are not charging the taxpayer this money. So it is Monroeville who chose to charge churches, charge schools, charge residents. And so whoever they wanted to put in their ordinance, it's on Monroeville, it's not Gateway. And so anybody getting any discount, that's on Monroeville, not Gateway. I don't know how else to say that. Mrs. Delaney? Oh, I just want to ask, you initially paid that 90000 and that was for 11, were all the 11 parcels, are they all school property? If, did we not, when we paid it, we did not fill or know we were exempt or should have been exempt? Why did we even pay in the first place? Because under the law, you need to pay it and go back and get it back from the judge. If you fail to pay it and we're wrong, then you'll have penalty and interest, just like a, a tax liability. Even though they're not calling it a tax, if you pay it late, you're gonna have a penalty and interest. So we pay it on time and then hopefully get the money back. They get to earn money on it, off of it. I don't know what kind of account it's in, but if it was an interest bearing account, then they're making money off of our money and, and May, I'm hoping we get it back, but those years that we didn't have it, we didn't make money off of it. And the second thing I would just, the other 
Correct. But these MS4 fees, so these, the, this started a long time ago. I can't, I can't remember when they, the, EP, the DEP came down and said that these permits have to be issued. And this has been a long time coming. All municipalities that are collecting stormwater will be eventually coming through. And if they haven't done so already, they are doing it shortly. Um, so everybody in the state of Pennsylvania is eventually going to get hit by this. I think what is happening are municipalities, they're waiting to see how to implement this better and see how Monroeville or other municipalities have already done it. And I know for a fact, because I've gotten calls from other school districts, inquiring about the status of our litigation because other school districts are waiting to see what happens in this litigation to see whether they jump in to their municipalities and say, hey, we're exempt. So if we are found exempt, it's a state code. Well, so it, it, it doesn't necessarily behave as a government. It gives them precedent. So the Court of Common Pleas isn't the highest court in the state of Pennsylvania. It goes Court of Common Pleas. This would go to the Commonwealth Court and then to the Supreme Court. But it gives them a precedent to be able to rely upon because there isn't a decision with respect to specifically MS4 fees. There is a decision, a Supreme Court decision, with respect to sewers, which I believe this is still is the same thing as a sewer. Whether it's a sanitary sewer or a stormwater sewer, a sewer is a sewer is a sewer. So um, we don't have a decision again for stormwater fees or stormwater sewers. Okay, there are a few other small religious educational organizations here in the Monroeville Pitcairn area and they're not on the lawsuit. But as Rick just said, they don't have to be on the lawsuit to be affected by the positive or negative outcome of the lawsuit that we are taking ownership of and leading, right? Correct. Um, does it apply to public school and private? I, the school code will still apply to the private school, parochial schools. So they will get the benefit if we win. Voice campus. Um, under the school code, I would have to check, but I would think that they would still fall under that provision of 776. Because it's Boys Campus, I would just, I'm wary of saying because it's collegiate, I'd have to check because I don't, I don't generally deal with that level. Um, but my gut would say, yes, it would still apply. Thank you. I was just wanting to say, um, being a part of Sunrise School, we're piggybacking off the gateway. They were apprehensive of paying the, store, the storm store tax. Um, their budget is minimal compared to gateway. That's a so, fee, remember? It's a fee. It's a fee. Sorry. <laughs> it's a fee. It's a fee. Um, but what I'm saying is they are anticipating, and every meeting we have, they ask, you know, if we heard anything. So this would benefit, you know, for them also. Just put that out there. Scotty, I think Forbes, too, you're having the same issue. Do you have anything else? Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any questions? Anyone on administration have any questions? I don't want to forget about you because I can't see you in the room. All right, seeing none, I'm just going to read this uh, little closing that uh, board leadership put together. And if there's any other comments from board members when I'm done, feel free. If not, we will move on or you can address them in your board reports again this evening. But to summarize our position, um, we wrote the follow board leadership wrote the following statement. Um, Mrs. Ms. Dice gave an excellent presentation summarizing the background and reason for the lawsuit. It is the opinion of the board and the district solicitor that Gateway is exempt from the fee as per the Pennsylvania School Code, which is still up on the screen for those uh, viewing from home. Other schools, as she explained, have interpleaded into the lawsuit as additional plaintiffs. A secondary point, not the primary argument, is that the ordinance created by Monroeville only exempted some not all nonprofits, including schools, based solely on being a religious entity. This is discriminatory in nature. 
This point was added to the lawsuit in response to the municipality making the argument in their own rebuttal that the fee assessed is applied evenly and equally to all properties. The reality, uh, as she explained, is that that is not the case. The district is not taking the stance that any such religious entity should not receive a discount on the fee. We believe the wording in the municipal ordinance excludes the district from such a discount in a manner that is inconsistent with state law. Yes, I did receive a call asking for us to remove the portion of the suit that mentions churches, but all other plaintiffs in this lawsuit would have had to agree to do so. And that decision may even require court approval if there was simply, and there was simply not enough time to follow up for all of that to happen before council made this decision last Tuesday to remove the discount from the ordinance. Even if the district were given enough time to remove the wording from the lawsuit in question, it would have done so against the advice of our solicitor, which you heard this evening. Pointing out the discriminatory nature of their ordinance only further strengthens our case. The school board is not of the opinion that religious ent entities should be denied the discount created in the ordinance. We simply want to see the discriminatory language removed, thus extending the discount to all schools, including Gateway. My personal suggestions to the mayor were as follows. One, rewrite the ordinance and include all tax exempt properties in the discount or two, settle the lawsuit with us and the additional language regarding churches would no longer be an issue, correct? Correct. Sadly, they refused both. The attack on the taxpayers and the religious institutions in this community are coming from the council and the council alone, and they are now trying to use the Gateway School District as the scapegoat for this poorly planned and illegally written ordinance. The fact that they said we would not work with them and their hands are tied is simply untrue. Council had several options available to deal with the mistake it made when drafting the ordinance. If the wording in question was legal, there would have been no reason to remove it in order to help the municipality in the lawsuit. The reality here is that it did hurt their case because it was discriminatory and that is why they voted to remove it. Instead of simply recognizing the mistakes made in drafting this ordinance and correcting them, Council has decided to take a case they have a little chance of winning to court as they attempt to defend the illegal assessment further burning the taxpayers of Monroeville and Pitcairn with legal fees and other costs associated with the court process. The mayor and council chose to pressure the school board to remove the wording. If we had agreed to do so, it would have meant we were taking action against the best interests of the Gateway School District in order to strengthen the municipality's case against the district. Council described our lawsuit as a quote, disaster for the district. The true disaster is that the municipality imposed an illegal fee on the Gateway School District, i.e. and the taxpayers, while acting in a discriminatory manner against the district. And then they have the gall to blame the district for calling them out on it. This board is committed to protecting the taxpayers and it's high time Monroeville Council show the same commitment. With that, I would like to open it up to any of my colleagues for additional comments. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I wanted to ask. Thank you. Okay. Well said, Mary Beth. I think it's a shame that we have to even have these conversations back and forth the way we are. I think we can all just be professionals and handle this thing the way we're supposed to. Set, sir. Well, if anyone wants to comment on your board reports, feel, feel free to. We'll just move along. And I don't have any comments from residents on agenda item two, Bonnie. No, I have none. Okay. If anything comes through, let me know. We'll move on to section A minutes from previous meetings. There were uh, quite a few. Resolve the Gateway School Board of Directors approves the minutes of the following previously held meetings. Study session, August 11th. Regular board meeting, August 18th. Is there a motion? Okay. Motion by Mr. McIntyre, second by Mr. Williams. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carries, Bonnie. Thank you. Mr. Shaw, are you with us? Yes, Mrs. Ricci, I am. Uh, section B, resolved that the Gateway Board of School Directors approve sections B1 list of bills and B2 monthly financial statements as listed in section B at the Tuesday, September 15th, 2020 regular board meeting. 
That's consists of specifically Section B1 list of bills for September 2020. Also, the second Section B1 list of bills added after the study session for September 2020. And also Section B2, the monthly financial statements for the month of August 2020. Question by Mr. McIntyre, second by Mr. Williams. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Chart, I see we're paying another 68000 to our um, architects. Yes. How much do we have in this construction fund set aside for this? Their, their funds are not set aside. Funds would be coming from the new bond issue to pay for the project. Uh, the general fund is advancing the funds to the construction fund in order to pay the architect fees, in order to design the project, in order to be able to go out to bid. Okay, so today, from the numbers that you have, we've given the architect $824,999.99. That's correct. Okay, now will that be put back into the general fund after bond issue? Once a bond is issued, yes, uh, they would be reimbursed. Uh, right now, that amount is showing is between the two funds, the due to, due from. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You have a question for this one, Scott. I should have asked you earlier. We were talking about the MS4 fee and that we paid the $90,000 for year one. Do you know off the top of your head if we paid the second year yet? We did not pay the second year. Okay. Uh, since we were in litigation, we only paid the first year and we have not paid anything additional since then. Now, if you don't pay it, if it's not paid by the end of the year, will you be um, penalized? If, excuse me, even though you're in litigation. If it's not paid for the year 2020. According to Chelsea, I think but the answer would be yes. The answer would be yes. Yes, they still would be penal get the penalty if they, were, if they were successful in litigation, you would have to pay interest and penalty. Okay. All right. Thank you. Are there any questions in section B? Roll call, Bonnie. Yes, Mrs. Delaney. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Gottman. Aye. Mr. McIntyre? Aye. Mr. Ritter? Aye. Mrs. Warning? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. She said I. 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 She said oh, I. Thank you. Ask, yes. Mr. Williams? Aye. Thank you. Motion. Mrs. Cerucci? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, section C, we did not have any items previously tabled, so we'll move to section B, all agenda. Thank you, Ms. Sorucci. Resolved that the Gateway Board of School Directors accepts and approves the personnel agenda items 1 through 11 as listed in section D for the regular board meeting of Tuesday, September 15th. Under section one for resignations, we have six listed. We do want to call attention to the three retirements that are listed and wish them the best. Nancy Piles um, has served the district for 22 years. Michelle White, 28 years as a paraprofessional. And we did have one addition since last week and that is Mike Lafredo as a custodian who has served eight years with the school district. Under section two, leave of absences, we have four listed. Under transfers, there are 10, which are dictated by the collective bargaining agreements. Under section four, we have a recall from furlough, and that's approving the following individual to recall from furlough for the position indicated. Section five, under employment, we have seven, five are new since the last Tuesday, um, which are paraprofessionals that we have added on. Under section six, it's the Gateway Cyber Teachers um, appointed and alternates for the elementaries, K through six. Section seven is recommending the monetary stipend for the Gateway Cyber Academy grades seven through 12. The last meeting we did the elementaries, this is recognizing the secondary. And we have six teachers and alternates listed for approval there. Under supplemental contracts, we have one who's, we're re requesting to rescind the motion 
for Ryan Doyle and then to reappoint it as a split position between Ryan and Kevin Hoffner. So that's the reasoning um, for number nine. Under 10 athletic event workers, we have 25 listed, six are new since the last meeting and under volunteers, we have three. Um, Motion by Mr. Williams, is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Gottman, is there a discussion? Questions? I got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, just for my clarification, I guess, uh, between section seven and eight, uh, section or item eight, you know, we're given the rate of $30 per student for the, the teachers listed. So who's getting the stipend of $30 per student? On number below that on the next page, it lists six teachers. And that's again based on um, at the end of the nine weeks, how many students they had in that nine week period. Okay, so we're approving the monetary stipend, then approving the teacher to get the stipend. Is that how this works? Correct. Yeah, so the six teachers on the next page are the ones that received the stipend in seven and eight. Is that right, Trish? Correct, for seven through 12. The last meeting we approved the element, the approval of the elementary stipends. This is recommending approval for a secondary now that we've got into the program. And that's the six teachers who based on the scheduling will be recommended for the stipends and alternates. Can't hear you. I can't hear them either, Bonnie. Yes. I can now. Hey. Hey. Uh, okay. hey, there we are. I think we're back. I think so. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Brown. So to answer your question, and I think Trish, you can chime in. I'm not sure if you heard Mr. Gottman's question. Number seven is the authorization of the 712 approval of the stipend, and then the teachers would be listed in item eight. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, board members? I just have one comment. Michelle White, um, as far as I started working with her in 1998, and I just want to wish her the best of luck and uh, her best. Good luck. Good luck, Michelle. Anything else? Okay, Bonnie, roll call when you're ready. Yes. Um, Mr. Gallagher. Aye. Mr. Gottman. Aye. Mr. McIntyre. Mr. Ritter. Aye. Mrs. Warning. Mr. Williams. Aye. Mrs. Cerucci. Aye. Mrs. Delaney. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on to section E, conferences and conventions. Can you just read that, Dr. Short? Uh, we, have, we have Dr. Chayton. Thank you, Dr. Short. Resolved that the Gateway Board of School Directors approves and authorizes the following conferences and conventions as listed in Section E at the regular board meeting of Tuesday, September 15th. We have two conferences listed, uh, one for Guy Rossi and the other conference for Angela Dietrich. Uh, Motion by Mr. McIntyre, second by Mr. Williams. Questions or comments? I do have one. Exactly. I, I, <laughs> I just wanted to explain to uh, the public last week, 
we had our closed caption on for the first time and it should be functioning this week as well. And apparently in here in the boardroom, we were able to see the closed captioning live as we were speaking, but not everybody at home could see that. And we were making some jokes about it because when we mentioned the name Guy Rossi, the closed captioning said Gyro City was one of the examples, which was Mr. McIntyre's joke. But I just wanted to clarify that that's what was happening last week because I think there was some confusion from some people watching as to as to what we were joking about, and I just I just wanted to clear that up. Um, I don't have any other questions on the conferences. Anyone? Okay, I'm kidding. Hold on. <laughs> okay, roll call, Bonnie. <laughs> Mr. Gottman. Hi. Mr. McIntyre. Hi. Mr. Ritter. Hi. Mrs. Warning. Hi. Mr. Williams. Hi. Mrs. Cerucci. Hi. Mrs. Delaney. Hi. And Mr. Gallagher. Hi. Motion carries. Section F is administrative before Dr. Short. Elementary education, Dr. Rossi, please. Thank you, Dr. Short. Item number one is approve the following Title I school-wide plans for the 2021 school year as listed. Item number two is approve the following supplemental resources and there's some uh, donations included there as well from PTAs. Item number three is approve the agreement with the EdTech to provide a Google Classroom parent webinar as depicted in exhibit F. Item number four is um, new uh, for this meeting is approve the following dissertation research study Teachers' Perceptions of Successfully Sustained PBIS Programs from Nathan Pfeiffer, and that'd be working with CSA, CSE teachers on a voluntary basis. Item number five, Eastern Area, approval of Eastern Area Special Schools Joint Committee, mail ballot, and approval of officers for Joint Board of School Directors as de depicted in Exhibit G, uh, Mr. Pushkar from Allegheny Valley President, Mr. Thompson from Penn Hills, Vice President, and Mrs. Warning from Gateway School District, Secretary. Item number six, approve the Student Transportation of America list of school bus drivers and monitors for the 2021 school year as depicted in Exhibit H. Item number seven, recognize the following district booster clubs and support organizations who have properly submitted applications to the district for a 2021 fiscal year as depicted below. Item number eight, approve the pest management control services with Ehrlich and the total amount of $5,316 for the 2021 fiscal year as depicted in Exhibit I. Item number nine, accept the following district donation received during the 2021 fiscal year. Uh, it's for University Park Elementary School PTO, $2,500 check. Jennifer Hoffner for $500 per grade level at the University Park Elementary School. Item number 10, Approve the district's sale of obsolete and damaged technology department equipment consisting of approximately 104 iPads, 31 iMacs, and 238 MacBook Airs to a GEO repair, and estimate total sale proceeds amount to be received in the range of as low as $7,596 to as high as $82,295 to be determined based on the actual quantities, conditions, and grading of the devices by a GEO repair, and that's as depicted in Exhibit J. Item number 11, this was new, this was added after study session meeting. Approve the purchase of 12 portable air conditioning units to be utilized for the Gateway Middle School with a total expenditure amount not to exceed $7,200 during the 2021 fiscal year. Note, the district previously purchased 40 portable air conditioning units for the Mossai Middle School during the 2019-2020 fiscal year. by Mr. Goldman, second. second by Mr. Williams. Questions? I got one. Go ahead, Mr. Goldman. Clarification. Can uh, somebody provide a little more detail on item four, the dissertation research study, what it's about? I, I can add um, that conversation discussion now. There is a policy within um, our school district that we must have approval from the board to enter into any type of dissertation agreement. Uh, this goes back probably 25 plus years to a uh, dissertation that resulted in some um, 
we'll say litigation against the district, uh, PSWIM, uh, that was um, uh, taking place from the University of Pittsburgh through one of our employees and the board was not aware of it at the time. Uh, so uh, since then, any type of formal dissertation approval uh, must be ratified by the board. Specific, a dissertation is a study performed study. by a Absolutely. university student who's seeking a, a, a master's or a, a doctorate in some area. They come to the school and they ask to study something and the board gets to review it and then approve it or disapprove it. Correct, and um, with the dissertation, uh, uh, th there's no um, study or research being conducted with students. Uh, it, it's always with uh, employees that we would be moving forward with. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mrs. Delaney. So I see that we, we have approved the, the purchase. They have not already been bought, even though the weather is now cooling, but we still will be able to get these very soon. Yes, uh, I've spoken with Bob Brown. Our uh, goal is once we have the approval, go out and purchase and begin installation. It's not something that can happen overnight with installation, uh, but it is our effort. Uh, uh, let's try not to get pulled by the nice cool weather coming in because we know next week it could be 90 degrees again. Uh, but it's our goal to get those in as soon as possible. Mr. McIntyre. Aye. Mr. Ritter. Aye. Mrs. Warning. Mr. Williams? Aye. Mrs. Cerucci? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Aye. Mrs. Delaney? Aye. Mr. Gallagher? Aye. And Mr. Gottman? Aye. Motion carries. Sorry, I'm sorry, I did have a comment. I was trying to assemble the, the thought in my head about why add these extra air conditioners at this late time. We're about to move into fall. And from my perspective, we're requesting that the staff and the students wear masks at this time. When it gets really, really hot, it gets even more uncomfortable for students and uh, staff to wear these masks. So as much as I would like to, to not, you know, put the burden on having these installed and, and used for a short amount of time, for the relief or the, the health and safety protection that it might give some of the folks who might you know, sweat on the mess or something like that. I'm going to, I did, err in favor of voting in favor of this for that reason. Thanks for that clarification. I think that's important. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, there are not. None. Okay. And we can move on to reports. Um, <coughs> we are in day six and uh, can't thank the students and, and staff for truly uh, cultivating uh, an identity with instruction. Uh, understanding that it is three different platforms. However, the staff has gone above and beyond what we've asked them to do. We recognize the difficulties uh, leading up to this. Uh, technology can be overwhelming to some, not only for our staff, but also for our children. Uh, Michael in his department has done an incredible job troubleshooting, uh, being available, being visible, uh, to not only our staff, but our parents and our children, even at night. Uh, I, I was meeting with two of our tech staff this morning, and um, one of them was relaying to me uh, a phone call at 8 o'clock last night from a third grader who had questions about tech issues. <laughs> and then he took the phone call, and he was on the uh, uh, 
line and troubleshooting, and then they got into conversation about Minecraft. <laughs> so uh, it, it's truly working. Uh, again, it's not uh, an ideal learning situation that we would want for our children. We all understand uh, and feel the importance of getting our kids back in school five days a week. Uh, we are monitoring uh, the, the daily dashboard from PDE in Governor Wolf's office. And it is our hope that the, the surge will lessen. Uh, but uh, I, I do want to commend everyone for their efforts uh, in uh, really stepping up and, and getting everything working properly as best we can. And I'm proud of everyone's efforts. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chakey, do you have anything? Nothing further, thanks. Dr. Rossi? Nothing at this time, thank you. Mrs. Bungard? Nothing at this time, thank you. Mrs. Crump? Nothing at this time, thank you. Mr. Shaw, I didn't forget about you. Nothing further, thank you. Mr. Dice? Perfect. Okay, let's start with Mrs. Warning, board reports. Um, I just wanted to thank again to our bus drivers. It's been a challenge for them. Uh, they're not having full buses, but they're making every route and all their stops. Thank you to maintenance and our custodial staff, the cafeteria workers, all our paraprofessionals, teachers, and our administrators, our tech department, and our students. Uh, it is a challenge, but talking to these students they're adjusting very well um, with masks and everything. So thank you for doing everything we're asking to do. And we will get that education to you. Also, our football team played on Friday night. Um, it was really good to see the kids come out. They were all hyped up and cheerleaders and the band. It was a great, great evening, especially since they won. Uh, another football game this Friday coming up against Elk Park. And volleyball has been going on and doing well, and our soccer team. So hopefully everything continues, and that's all I have. Thank you, Mrs. Warning. Mr. Ritter. Sure thing. Okay, so I noticed on social media that there have been some wrinkles and lumps and bumps with the use of the Zoom and the online technology. That happens next week. The HL7, that's the Health Level 7 International Working Group meeting will be held worldwide. I'm an EHR work group co-chair. That's electronic health record work group co-chair. This will be the second time that instead of meeting in person around the world, we'll be meeting virtually. And the lumps and bumps happen at all levels. So just about a half hour ago, Michael had to come running up and restart some system. Just be patient. You know, when this happens at home, folks, you know, you, you don't get on. It's, it may be your fault. It may not be your fault. Sometimes it just takes time for the technology to unbuffer itself, unwrinkle itself, and somebody to notice something's wrong and start back up. So you have been patient. I've been noticing that on the social media as well. Some of you have had flawless um, experiences, some not quite so flawless, but Dr. Short, you and the team have been doing a terrific job with this new approach to uh, online education. So congratulations to you and your team on that. Number two, a judge has uh, recently declared uh, Governor Wolf's approach uh, a little troublesome, and he's written a 66-page report about it. I haven't read it yet, but I'd like to read it. And um, many of the folks that on the PSBA's weekly buzz uh, team were talking about it during today's 12.30 to 1.30 meeting. So we're trying to figure out what that might mean for us going forward. And of course, with respect to sports and parents coming to stadiums or in, in the buildings, what all those things mean. So our teams continue to try to work and react to the latest and greatest uh, advice and recommendations that come down from above. That's my report. Wonderful. Mrs. Delaney. Yes, I'd also like to commend all of the staff, the teachers, administrators for the, well, six days. Six days. And Particularly also, as we mentioned, the, um, Michael Brown and his staff with the technology, as well as our custodial staff working very hard to make sure that the buildings and the rooms and everything are, are kept safe and sanitized for our students. Uh, I'd like to 
mention something some of you, and particularly history teachers, may be familiar with George Santiago, who made a statement that said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And the reason I'm saying that, 57 years ago, on this day, four little young girls were killed in the 16th Street Baptist Church bomb. I'm going to say their names, and their names are Addie Mae Collins, who was 14, Cynthia Wesley, who was 14, Carol Robertson, who was 14, and Carol Denise McNear, who was 11. And sometimes, as difficult as these things are that happen in our history, we still do not need to forget them. And of course, I know my condolences are still going out to families and parents of those young girls. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Mr. Gallagher, jump over to your side of the room. Yeah, it, it's interesting. We're talking about history and and technology, and it doesn't seem possible that it was 23 years ago today that Google.com was registered as a domain name, and now that's just become part of everyday life. <coughs> um, also, there was a in 1616, they uh, and uh, Frascati, Italy, the first free public school was opened, and that was something that had never been done before. And we're here as a result of, of that, that work. So although we have all these new things going on, they become normal quickly. Yeah, so. Some things hopefully not so normal as others. <laughs> but, uh, also, um, as you expressed earlier, sympathies to the um, Cavalier family, the, uh, the boss. Mr. Gottman. Um, one, uh, something I should have mentioned last week, I do mention this week, uh, I spoke to some residents a few weeks ago in regards to the computer pickup and they just want to express their, their gratitude for it. And you know, when I came up, uh, everybody was very nice, talkative, very well done and made them proud that, you know, they're from Gateway and this is something we did. So I want to pass it along to the administration. Um, we also had a policy meeting last week and not much really occurred. We are, uh, there were some tweaks that we are going to, I believe, put up for public display soon um, regarding policies 103, 104, which is uh, discrimination and sexual harassment for students and staff, uh, policy 111 for lesson plans, policy 705 for facilities and workplace safety, policy 824, maintain professional adult slash student boundaries, Policy 904, public attendance at school events, and policy 907, school visitors. So be on the lookout for that for display, as we'll probably see on our uh, next meeting. And lastly, I do want to apologize. I was busy this past week and was unable to put together my art presentation. Um, I know Mr. Godman. District, I'll, I'll turn to my resignation. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna try to see if I can get it worked on uh, as early as tomorrow so you can get that on the broadcast. If not, I'll have for next meeting. But as I am running out of artwork from last year, I am looking forward to this year's selection of artwork. And as my board report. Do we have a date for the next policy meeting? I know there were some other policies. Mr. Ritter brought up needing kind of urgent attention. Do we have that on the calendar yet? The first week in October, I believe we, I don't know if we set it on a date. We were looking at that week. Uh, but I did want to announce a September, and I know Bob Brown's outsider. 29th building, please give me the thumbs up. September 29th building and grounds meeting that will be held here via Zoom uh, uh, for building and grounds at six o'clock. So we will get more information about the date for the next policy committee meeting, uh, but I did want to announce the building and grounds meeting for September 29th at six. Okay, thank you. Mr. Williams. Well, I really don't want to share some of my comments on the artwork tonight. So. <laughs> Nothing this evening. Oh, oh, he's hanging his head in shame. Mr. McIntyre. Oh, uh, yeah, just quickly, let's mask off with me a little bit too much. Um, just, I was going to touch on some of the same things Mr. Ritter spoke on. Um, just, you know, looking at social media, some of the emails and texts and phone calls we get. Um, there's a lot of, there's a handful of people that are out there that are having some frustration. I'm, we've had some issues with logging in here and there. 
by and large, I, I found that the, the staff has been responsive and uh, we've been able to work out, at least in, in my house, all the bugs. And uh, everybody will seem to focus on the negative a lot. But there, there's been a lot of really, really good comments and, and praising of particular teachers and, and just, you know, how hard they're working. And so there's a lot of positive going out there as well. I'm glad you touched on that as well. Um, and as far as the, the court decision on the, the attendance, uh, me and Mary Beth had a brief conversation about that earlier tonight to see if we even want to discuss mm -hmm. it tonight. And, you know, my, my thoughts are that ruling hasn't changed anything yet. Obviously, we're waiting on that. But I think we're going to get, get our directive from the WPIL, you know, and that's more or less where that change will, will get kicked forward. Uh, and there's two believe the governor has announced an appeal to that sort of statement. Yeah. Okay, well said. Anything else? Oh, I got plenty, but I'm oh, going to okay. be nice. Okay. Go ahead. No, I said I, I have plenty I want to say. Oh, but you're not? I no, thought I that was your intro. I don't think we want <laughs> FCC violation. Okay. No, I don't want that. Okay. All right. Well, I don't have anything else um, either, so I would seek a motion to adjourn. Oh, sure. Motion to adjourn by Mr. Ah. McIntyre, second by Williams. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>